All right, well, we um, have been in a series called Kingdom Come, and this series is winding now. We have two more weeks of this series before we go into um, our summer series. Um, but uh, it's been an exciting time. It really has been an exciting time. Um, and I'm excited to have uh, two speakers come today. So you're going you're gonna to get a tag team attempt today. Um, and so here's what we're going to do. We're going to have Michaela come up first. Uh, Michaela, she's going she's gonna to bless the mic, right? Amy, I want you to just come up, Michaela. <laughs> Michaela's going to come up. And then right after Michaela. Um, she's, uh, forgive her, she's wearing my shirt today, apparently. Yeah, I didn't realize how big that shirt was on you. That's awesome. Uh, you ironed it for me. It's really big on you. All right, but it is ironed. Amen. Amen. Like the uh, Gen Z would come up here with a wrinkled shirt and not think anything about it, but here we are. So, again, she she's got an amazing word. Spend some time with her on this. So, give her a hand again. Okay. And oh yeah, and then Cody is gonna follow her. Cody, do you have a? Give, okay. So he wants to be hands free. Okay. Let's do this. Hi guys, um, at this point I don't have to introduce my name because my dad's done it for me. Um, but we are in the middle of a sermon series called Kingdom Come um, and we started these series with um, the book of Judges last summer, right? And if you remember that right after we went into the Honey of the Rock series, we, were, we had found out that in our Bonita building amidst our transition last year, there was honey being built in the rock in our Bonita building. And then we came to our last series, which was Building the Hearth, where we, let, we learned how to steward God's intimate presence. And now we're here. And I kind of want to tweak the kingdom come because I think it's really important to remember that when the kingdom comes, it's going to usher a certain culture with it, right? That is the culture that we have been reborn into as Christians. We've been reborn into kingdom culture, and we are responsible of taking part in that and showing people what that actually looks like. Now, we live in such a time where culture has so many subcategories to it, right? We've got pop culture, clan culture, counterculture, and even the very familiar cancel culture. But this has been a series about how we as a church participate in the less recognizable but prevalent reality that is kingdom culture. Our culture is ever-changing. Our culture has always been evolving, adapting, forming itself into different things, and especially from what we read in biblical literature, things are completely different, especially Christianity in its meaning. Living in such a privileged Western culture, it's easy for us Americans to blur the lines of what Christianity is or religion is in this instance is and what it really means in its true manifestation. Now, although Christianity was birthed by the miraculous resurrection of a Jewish carpenter by the get, from the ghetto of Nazareth, it is a movement, and this is evidenced by its ability to survive the calendar over 2,000 years and counting. Its impact in over many countries, we've got two, over 2 billion Christians in over 157 countries, and the many different cultures that seem to have done a very well job making it make sense in their specific context. Now with it surviving the calendar, we've had over 2,000 years to interpret Jesus and his story and what our faith looks like. And this could be maybe the reason why we have so many different denominations under the umbrella term Christianity. Now we still haven't all come to agreement as to what Christianity looks like, what we're supposed to follow, who we're supposed to follow, and what certain things mean or don't mean. Because Christianity is multi-generational and is most effectively passed down through family, you've no doubt heard the terms your mother's faith or your father's faith. Now, as an obvious pastor's kid, you can completely understand that I'm track with this, right? I remember not being allowed to not go to church. Like, I had to be half dead in bed, like that type of stuff. And along with that, it was fine because I love children's ministry. I lived it up there. My favorite snacks were goldfish and animal crackers, and that was, that's what was supplied, bro. We never had that at home. Now, with that being said, I thought I was queen of the classroom because all I had to say was, well, my dad thinks, and give that little look, and they'd like be like, you little, you know. <laughs> now, it wasn't until a year before, <laughs> it wasn't up until a year before I went to my uh, mission trip in Africa this past summer that um, my parents' faith actually became my own. Come on. Come on. Now... 
before I go too far into this, I want to set a precedent that being Christian means we're choosing to represent Jesus in anything and everything we do. It says in Colossians 3.17 that whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. With that being said, we should be consistently asking ourselves the question, what would Jesus do? But I'll be honest, this is a lot easier said than done. And Jesus sets this example in the Gospels where he meets the Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4, he comes to her asking, hey, bro, like, can you get me some water? And she looks at him like, because this is so culturally inappropriate, she kind of looks at him like, you know, and I can imagine Jesus kind of cracking a smile before he does something so iconic. Because right after he, ask, he asks her in John 4, 9, she says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Which is further translated to, Boo, why are you even talking to me? Right? Now, this totally could have gone in different directions. It's easy to forget that Judaism started as a religion only for Jews. But once Jesus died, he tore the veil, making Christianity available for anyone and everyone. However, we find ourselves being divisive and clicky. Now we're here to see others the way God sees them and the way that they were created. And by committing ourselves to walking alongside people and hearing God on how we can speak into their lives, we're aligning ourselves with the kingdom culture that we were reborn into. We aren't here to represent anyone else but Jesus. Once we agree to become a child of God, we're signing an ambassador contract. Now the biggest example of this to me was when Jesus was being captured um, and was awaiting trial. Now you see this in the book of John where 18, where Simon Peter is cutting off the ear of the guard, guard Malchus as he was taking Jesus away. Now you know this was taking place in John because John name drops, bro, right? He was like, no, it was Simon Peter, okay? He's like the gossip girl of them. We love him, okay? We get the facts here. Now right after Simon Peter cuts off Malchus's ear, Jesus says, I must drink the cup given to me. And he picks up his ear and heals them heals him. Now, let's take a pause because I do have a few questions with us surrounding this topic. In our everyday lives, so think like every day but Sunday, right? Um, think about what do we do when people, what do we do back to people when they try to hurt us? How quick are we to want to hurt somebody who has wronged us? Now, I recently started driving um, not recently, like a year, about a year ago. And to be completely honest, some of you guys are terrible at it. Like, really bad at it. And with that being said, everyone who drives in this room, I'm going to assume, has been cut off before, right? Yeah. Think about your reaction, because I can think about mine. It's, it's not great, okay? That's not the reaction we're supposed to be having. Or if we look into an even more frustrating uh, like action where when we're managing people in the workplace or like I did a lot of school school managing for events What do you do when the people under you? Correct you Right and they're right for doing so What about when they correct you they're rightly do for, like rightly they rightly do so and it's in front of your boss That stings what about when they um, question your authority? How do you feel about that one? Now, I can even translate it into a social aspect, right? What do you do when you have a group of friends and it's great, it's going great, and then out of nowhere they stop talking to you? Stop including you in the hangout, social events. They just completely start avoiding you, and then you hear that they're talking bad about you behind your back. Now, none of these feelings are ever great. They'll never feel good. And it's usually in these situations where we compromise who we're being called up to be and we're matching other people at a different level that God gave us the patience and ability to rise above. If representing Jesus never really crosses our minds in these situations, we will find ourselves with swords in our hands while our Savior bore nails in his. No. We're, no, <laughs> we're, 
we're imperfect, and so we won't be completely like Jesus all the time, but it's important to realize the differences between these comparatively small issues. We don't always find ourselves having the grace and love for others when we aren't even close to putting our lines on the line for it like Jesus did. No, I think the way that we respond to these situations really comes down to our culture. Now, I'm really only a 17-year-old who's graduated high school, so you don't have to take my word for it, but I think I have a pretty good idea as to what our culture looks like and what it preaches. The kingdom culture that we've been reborn in doesn't always align with the Christian culture that we've created. <laughs> now, this, is spe this specifically reaches out to me. One of my favorite examples of this was in a really good novel. If you haven't read it, you need to read it titled Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now this was an amazing novel and single-handedly almost changed the views of everybody during that time. It was written in 1852 by a white abolitionist by the name of Harriet Beecher Stowe and it was so influential that some places, even our own country, had banned it. And had banned it. Like they were like, no, don't, don't read it. Our economy is too important, right? Well, along this, we find, we meet this character by the name of Marie St. Clair, and there's no other word for her outside of insufferable. She was the worst. She uh, grew up in a very plentiful plantation, and her entitlement only grew as she did. And now, on top of this, she considered, her, she considered herself a devout Christian, right? Now, I will never forget the scene in the book where it talks about how she's coming home and she's like, oh yeah, I'm so happy because my pastor said that God blesses the system that slavery holds and that some people are just meant to be ruled by others. Now, she really lived this ideology out. This wasn't a joke to her. She really thought this was true. And it shows because even her own husband at this point refused to get behind such a religion that can condone something like this. Now, it's important to keep in mind that we're responsible for the image of God that we are portraying. When we're aligning ourselves with cultural views that are unbiblical, we're separating ourselves from God, worshiping something else other than him. It's important to remember that our culture won't always align with kingdom culture. And it's at some point we have to pick between the two. This isn't easy, which explains why Christianity is represented so poorly today. Being Christian isn't easy, and we're not going to be accepted by society. And we're incredibly lucky to live in a place like America, where we have the privilege to worship the God of our choice. And we can't be like everyone else, and Paul tells, Paul, Paul tells us this when he tells us not to be conformed to this world. Eventually, you have to pick between your love of the world and God, and you, you simply can't have both. Now, have you ever been around someone who thinks they know the meaning of the word, but they're using it in a different context or something of that sort, where, you're, where they've just said it so many times and they just kind of make up their own definition of it. Now that's almost exactly how we treat Christianity. We learn the meaning of words by, by being with people who use those words, who have learned it from other people, right? Well, it's not often we actually look up a word that we've heard and said billions of times and recheck the definition. Now, this is in some way comparative to Christianity. Some people experience the wrong kind of connotations of Christianity, and that could be why a lot of us still have church wounds that need to be addressed. However, until we address them, we find ourselves doing what my dad often says, bleeding on people that never cut you. We have started to really struggle at showing people the love of Jesus and representing him in the way that he deserves to be represented. And because we struggle, we're pushing people away, pushing people who we are called to love on and care for and help out into other areas to be loved by something or someone else. We as Christians are responsible to create an atmosphere that inspires and glows. We should be the first to love another person. We should be the first people that another wants to go to you to celebrate their like accomplishments. You should also be some of the first few people that someone wants prayer for when they're going through a hard time or a tough loss. That is our responsibility. However, we find ourselves being described as exclusive and judgy and self-righteous, which is oddly comparative to the descriptions of the Pharisees. 
but what do we do? I think we first need to recognize this behavior. A close friend of mine, Dr. John Harris, wrote a book about reaching out and sharing the gospel with more people online, but he introduced the idea that not everyone is actually very fond of Christianity because of the way they've experienced Christians. He says that knowing how you're perceived by people you want to reach uh, is critical for, re for, re for relationship building and overcoming obstacles to mission effectiveness. Now, one of my favorite examples he put down was um, whenever you go shopping, specifically online, right? Think like Amazon, think Nike, think like TikTok shop, something, whatever you want, whatever you shop online. Yep, those three. Um, most of us look at the reviews, right? Yes? Are we following? Okay. How often do you find a review by someone you actually know? No, never, you don't, right? And so you're trusting people you don't even know, you've never met, to tell you about a product and whatever they tell you at this point, your mind's made up. You take their word for it. Now imagine Jesus being the product, right? Yeah, you following me? Mm-hmm. It's easy for us to forget that every day we're representing Jesus to other people for better or for worse. And because it's usually been for worse, we find ourselves making minor adaptations to the word Christian, right? So some of us call each other, call, call each other or call ourselves Jesus-like or Christ-like or something of that sort, trying to ignore the immediate connotation that the word Christian suggests. Now, our lives should always seem like an open testimony of what God is doing through us and within us as his children. We should be more focused on kingdom culture, that our job is to be like Jesus, that we need to choose nail-scarred hands over sword-gripped hands, that we are his product. But in order for that to happen, we have to be uncomfortable. We have to take a deep dive in whatever God's asking us to do. We have to overcome something, slay some kind of giant. That could very much possibly be just transforming yourself from a Sunday morning Christian to a Monday morning one. Now, the person I'm about to bring up real quick, Cody, he has said multiple times that if you want a Red Sea miracle, you need to find yourself where that is your only option, right? You have to have no other choice for him. You have to be uncomfortable for God to part those waters. For being uncomfortable means you're doing something right. Come up here, brother. your papers. Oh, are you gonna need this cable? We can keep it, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Man, she killed it, didn't she? That's our future right there. That's really something to get hyped about. Like, come on, she killed it, didn't she? So let's go there. Let's let's get a little uncomfortable. Like, let's get a little uncomfortable because I really believe that we don't even take into account that when the Red Sea actually happens, that moment itself is actually really, really uncomfortable. Right. We all want God to show up in this big, powerful, miraculous way, and we're like, God, split the seas in my life. But have you actually taken like, it into account of what it would be like to be standing on a beach in between two big mountains and an army coming behind you, and then this massive freaking sea just goes, right. Come on. and we're not talking about 10-foot walls of water. We're not talking about 100-foot walls of water. We're talking about thousands of feet tall of water on each side. There's a path in between you, and you got to step out in faith and walk in the middle and hope that the person or the thing that is holding those walls back is going to hold it back enough and long enough for you to get through. That in itself is a very uncomfortable situation. And I would pledge to you that even though there are smaller Red Sea moments that happen in our life, God refuses or withholds his hand from moving in that kind of power because we would actually refuse to step into that moment because we're so fixated on the end result that we stop embracing the actual journey that it gets to get there. Does that make sense? 
And in that journey, we, through pain, through suffering, through loss, through victory, through glory, through wins, and through sacrifice, that's where faith is built up into that moment to be able to step into what God is doing, to be able to partner with what God is doing, and to be an active part in it. But we don't want to embrace that. I mean, look at social media, right? We highlight all of our wins. Everybody's page that you see, we're not talking about losses. We're not talking about the valleys. We're talking about the mountaintops. We're talking about the winds. We're talking about glory. And that's what we get fixated on because that's what we're obsessed with. But you see, when we're looking in the Bible, what I notice is, is yeah, there's a lot of signs, wonders, and miracles. But most of those thousands and hundreds of pages are actually dedicated to the valley. They're dedicated to the suffering. They're dedicated to the sacrifice. And we've gotten away from sacrifice. And I would pledge to you that, that Western Christianity is predominantly powerless because we lack sacrifice. We lack sensitivity to true sacrifice. We, we lack the actual meaning of sacrifice. We lack the embracing of sacrifice. We lack sacrifice, period. So we can't relate to people. We can't be in relationship with people, at least authentically, which is what that generation wants. We can't even be in a relationship with God. Because you can't have sacrifice without vulnerability, which is what I would pledge is what we're missing the most. Right. We're missing vulnerability. See, I'm out, I'm out on the street, and, and I, I, have a, I have a street ministry. I'm a street preacher. I'm not currently out right now because I just had my, my second beautiful daughter. But I'm not, when, when I'm out there, I can't tell you how many people I come across, and, and, and a lot of them are Christian. And they're like, well, I, I, I've, said, I've said the sinner's prayer. I'm good. I got a one-way ticket to heaven. I'm all right. I'm good. I'm all right. I, I like what you're doing, though. Y'all really think Jesus died for a one-way ticket to heaven? Like, just, like, let, let, let's just, let's introduce logic and reasoning into this, okay? If it was a one-way ticket to heaven, does he really have to come as a baby? Does he really have to be born into poverty? Does he really have to experience pain and suffering and loss? Does he really have to grow up into God? Does he really have to learn all these things, obedience? Does he really have to go through all that? Or can he just come as an almighty, powerful king on the clouds of heaven, just like Elijah went up on? He can announce his thing. He's like, I'm a perfect sacrifice. Go ahead, slay me. Y'all got your one-way ticket to heaven. I'll see you when you get there. Enjoy it down here. That would make so much more sense. But that's not what happened. You see, he, he, he came here in the most vulnerable state entrusted himself to his own creation that he knew hated him, was raised up in the ways of God, lived in what persecution and what slavery would look like, lived in situations that some of us have never even begun to scratch the surface of what it's actually like. He told his disciples, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but son of man has nowhere to lay his head, lived homeless, worked his his hands to the bone, and then he spent, he spent three years predominantly focused on serving, feeding, healing, teaching, loving the very same people that were ultimately just going to kill him. And the predominant message was, the kingdom is coming, the kingdom is here, this is how you live it, this is how you act new, this is what it looks like. But somehow, some way, we've turned it into, I'm going to get there one day, we've turned it into a destination rather than the person. That's the false gospel. So what are the ways that we can be vulnerable? There's four ways. And we can be vulnerable through our statements. This is all in relationship with God. We can be vulnerable with our statements, which is our struggles, our emotions, our pains, our, our confessions, our testimony. This is us going to God and, and making things known. And I think we probably got this really down pat. I think this is pretty good for the most part. A lot of us try to keep it hidden away and tucked away. But for the most part, I think you look at, at Christianity and it's like, okay, statements is good. Questions, the whens, the whys, the hows, the wheres, the whats, the wins, all that kind of stuff. 
I think we struggle with this a little bit, but for the most part, I think we're pretty good venters, especially in America. We like to make, we like to make it known that we have problems. But the, the next two are, are the ones that I think we have the biggest problems with because we go into our secret place and, and we really let God know uh, that he ain't doing what he's supposed to be doing according to us. And, and, and then maybe we, we do that for, if we're in our prayer closet for 10 minutes, let's just say, uh, we're doing that for nine minutes and 30 seconds. And what do you have to say, God? And then you give him 30 seconds to answer you. And by the way, you're not actually interested in what he's actually going to say because he's preconditioned and you've preconditioned an answer that you want him to say. And if it doesn't line up with that, you're not rocking with it. And if you don't have the patience to sit there, you walk out of the room and then you go on complaining. I'm just waiting on God to answer me, brother. Just waiting on God to remove me out of the tribulation. Friends, we have to be willing to listen to understand and willing to listen regardless of what he's going to say. We have to be open to whatever he's going to say instead of preconditioning and listening to respond. And I think this goes with evangelizing too. Two ears, one mouth for a reason, my mom always said. <laughs> the, last, the last one is our obedience. Is we have to have Abrahamic obedience. I apologize for the slide because I'm out of order, but it's okay. We have to have Abrahamic obedience. There's, a, there's an amazing pastor and author. His name is John Bevere. And he highlights five ways of Abrahamic obedience. And the first way is, is that we're going to obey regardless of its convenience. So when God asks you to do something, it doesn't matter if it's convenient or not. You do it because God asks you to do it. The second way is we obey regardless. Poor thing. Oh, my gosh. We obey regardless of the understanding, meaning we don't need to know why God is doing what he's doing or why God wants us to do what he wants us to do. We just have to have faith that God asked us to do it and we need to do it because that's the best option in that moment. The third is obeying regardless of the cost. It doesn't matter what it costs you because what you're going to get on the other side is far more worth than what you're giving up. The fourth way is obeying immediately. I, I am horrible at this because I'm a negotiator and I barter with God and you know you'd be out in public hey go pray over him <laughs> and hey you know if you put me here and you put him there or you do this then hey I know it's you Dr. John probably the best out of all of us arguably said that he struggles with this but immediate obedience is so necessary mm -hmm. The last one is obeying to the fullness of what God is asking you to do. Obeying to the fullness. Doing exactly what God asks you to do when he asks you to do it. <laughs> and you see, friends, what you're hearing right now is a manifestation of a spirit in a room. That's what you're hearing. Because right now we're, we're knocking on the edge of growth. We're about to break through a wall here if we allow it to happen. And the devil loves to creep in in this kind of moment. He loves to creep in. And he loves to distract. And he loves to make a scene. And he lie. He loves to, he loves to come in and try to snatch the seed that is being sown. He wants to turn you into rocky ground. You see, friends, we, we're, we're, we're supposed to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. But here in America, there's four big spirits that we really do submit to. Instead of being submitted to the Holy Spirit, a lot of us are submitted to the spirit of fear that says if we're vulnerable, we're going to be exposed. We'll be shamed. We'll be guilted. And we'll be rejected. The next spirit that loves to play is the spirit of false humility that says, well, I can't, I can't go to God and I, I, sh I shouldn't, you know what, I, I shouldn't go to God because my problems aren't as big as person A or person B or person C and he's got bigger issues at hand. Others, 
The third spirit that we love to listen to is, is the one that's really run, running rampant in, in America, and that's the spirit of pride and self-righteousness that says, well, if you just white-knuckle it, you can get through it. If you just white-knuckle it, you bear down, you pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you got this thing, you can take care of it. You don't need help. You don't need God's help on this. Don't waste this time. You got this. We can do it. I can do it all on my own. And then there's a spirit of, of drunkenness and gluttony. And this is the silent killer. This is, this is the one that comes through and says, hey, you know what? Like, <laughs> there's this really cool thing over here. Just drown yourself in some counterfeit comfort. You'll be okay. We don't need to deal with these things. Let's sweep these issues underneath the rug. We don't need to deal with them right now. Drown yourself in some counterfeit comfort. Go, go take a hit of that blunt. Go take a drink out of that glass. Go drown yourself in social media for 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Go get caught up in the news of sports. You see, so often we're, we're, we're praying for revival, uh, we're praying for God to do all these miraculous things, but you see, like, this is, this is our Christianity. And we end up walking around, instead of looking like free people, we end up walking around looking like this, telling people, you need Jesus. You need what I got. You need what I got. Blessed are the pure. I've seen your sins. Mm. You're not pure, Cody. Mm. I'm going to devour you, Cody. You're mine. This is perfect. This is perfect. You need Jesus. Mine! You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You are mine. How ridiculous you. does this look? They're not going to listen to you. Look at you, hypocrite. Look at this. Don't listen to him. Go back and comfortable. You don't want him. Mm. Look at him. Do you really gonna believe him? I've seen in your closet. Mm. <laughs> mm. You don't want to listen to this. Mm. What's your accusation, accuser? Lust. Greed. Mm. Pride. Mm. Don't walk away from me. Mm. Murder. Mm. Adulterer. Yeah. Idolater. Come on. Come on. Math teacher. Come on. <laughs> See. Keep going. Come on. You haven't gotten to the worst yet. Get behind me, Satan. In the name of Jesus, be silent. Back to where you came from. In the name of Jesus. These are my charges. These are. Every single one of them. Some of them only my wife knows about me. Every single one. And on my own, I can't do anything about it. Can't do anything about it. Because that dirty devil loves to use permanent marker to stain us. But the thing is, is there's a better man that says, it doesn't matter if you're a liar or wrathful. or a murderer. Or full of rage. A proud. Lazy. Manipulative.
drunk. Abusive. Idolater. My blood. Covers it up. Doesn't matter if you're an adulterer, a glutton, caught in lust, porn addiction, or drug addiction. Doesn't matter if you've coveted, doesn't matter if you've stole. Doesn't matter if you blaspheme my name. My blood is enough to wash that stain away. Come back and repent again because you fell back into pride. Come back and repent again because you manipulated. Come back and repent because you got caught up in laziness. Come back and repent because you had murderous thoughts. Come back and repent because you lied. Come back and repent because you fell into the spirit of gluttony. Come back and repent because you stole. It doesn't matter if you suffered with same-sex attraction. None of that matters. None of it matters. Because my blood washes you clean. There's somebody in the room that has a thought, well, it's not all erased. <laughs> You're right. It's not. I'm doing that on purpose because your scars still remain. Your scars still remain. Because now when people look at that, that's my testimony. This is what Jesus healed me from. Jesus sewed me up here. Jesus came into my heart here. Jesus changed my thoughts here. Jesus changed my desires here. But you know what he calls me now? Son, a saint, Come on. a believer. Come on. That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Redeemed. Yes. Somebody wants to start yelling out of the crowd anything else they got, go ahead. Restored. Forgiven. Forgiven. Come on. Ambassador. There you go. Keep going. Sanctified. Come on. Rise. Come on. Keep going. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Keep going. I'm not done yet. Let's go. Come on. There it is. Come on. I filled this cross up with sins. I think we can fill it up with identity too, right? Come on. Come on. Yep, there it is. Come on. Yep, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Filled with the Holy Spirit. There it is. You see, friends? This came up one way. It's leaving another. came up one way. It's leaving another. I'm not going back out into the world looking like the old. And just because it came up looking like that, and that's what the devil tried to do, because we were having a really, really good conversation, doesn't mean that that's what my cross was when he brought it up. It's been like this since 2020. 
This is how we move out in public. You want to see revival? You want to see people changed? You want to see signs, wonders, miracles? You want to see God in your life everywhere you go? You want to have a beautiful marriage? You want to have a beautiful relationship with your kids? You want to have a beautiful relationship with your mother and your father within your community? We need to be a light that so shines before the world. That way they look at us as a city on a hill and they're like, that's where peace is. That's where refuge is. That's where something different is. It's different than here. I need to go there because I need that. That's the crux of this message, friends. We need to look different. We can't look the same. We can't put back on the same old clothes. We can't walk around with handcuffs and blindfolds over telling people that they need something that we have when they look at us and they say, what do you have that I don't? You got a pair of chains and you can't see. I wouldn't follow you anywhere. Somebody in here would argue with me and say, well, Paul wasn't changed. The difference is, is he was still free. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. He was still free. Amen. We claim to be free, but we're in bondage. America could do so much for the kingdom. If we would really follow Jesus' words. You put up Matthew 26 for me. All Peter cared about was saving a life. Jesus, Jesus, you can't, no, you can't go. I'll never let that happen. You can never die. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You're focused on the things of man, not on the things of God. And then he gives us real deal instructions on how to do this thing. It doesn't say, follow me, and then learn how to deny yourself, and then pick up your cross. It doesn't say, follow me, and then pick up your cross, and then deny yourself. It says, anyone who wants to be my disciple, anyone who desires to come after me, must first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Why? Because we're not walking to Calvary anymore. We're walking from it, and we have to follow him. We're walking in victory, but the only way through victory, the only way the kingdom comes is if sacrifice comes first. Right. Come on. So let's deny ourselves, friends. Let's not try to save our own life. Let's lose it for his name's sake. Then maybe we'll find it. Amen? Amen. 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 Y'all can take a seat here for a second. When I tell you I was ready to jump up and start doing deliverance in the middle of the service, I was. <laughs> some, of, some of you know what I'm talking about because you've been in rooms where that happens and Amy and I were looking at each other because we didn't know what was going on and we were like, okay, here we go. It was bound to happen. We're <laughs> and can I just say that I love the Holy Spirit. Because um, during, during worship, um, I kept seeing this picture, getting this impression. Um, you, you guys know, have you ever tried to help like a wounded animal? I'm going somewhere with this, but you try to help this, this animal that's hurting and it's like, I, I know what to do to help you not, like, not feel the pain that you're in right now. It just keeps trying to snap at you. And I was seeing this picture during worship and I kept hearing this passage of scripture that's actually found in Jeremiah. Is there not a bomb in Gilead? And the context of that is just that Jeremiah is like crying out for Israel. Like my people are hurting, my people are hurting. And 
combined with this, and I'm like, okay, like, Holy Spirit, where are you, where are you going? And what I, I felt many of us walked into the room with today is we've got these areas of wounding that were, to Cody's point, and again, I didn't, Sean was the one who actually worked with them on their sermons. Like, I had no idea what was getting preached today. But there are these areas of wounding that many of us have walked in with, these sins, these different things. And the Lord's like, hey, if you would open up, I can actually, I, I can come in and I can help you with that. But we take on the, uh, the approach of the wounded animal. It's like, back off. Let me deal with it. I got this. Something that will set many of you guys free in here today is when you learn that there's a difference between transparency and vulnerability. When I'm transparent, I feel fine to share with you something that I've already walked through and gotten the solution for. Not the same thing as vulnerability. Vulnerability, it actually costs you something to share. And I would dare you to present to me a time where you got free and it didn't require vulnerability. James says, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. There's something in the opening up of our hearts to each other and to the Lord. It says, I, I cannot do this thing. I can't figure this thing out on my own. And I need you to bring healing to it. So with that, we're going to take some time and we're going to pray. Amen. So if you guys could stand. And then prayer team, if I can have you guys come forward here. So I'm going to pray, but we're going to have the altar open up here for you guys to come and to receive prayer. And it's, the call is just basically everything that Cody said. What's the thing that you're needing healing from that you've actually been holding back from the Lord? That can be something physical, that can be emotional, that can be a sin that you're caught up in. But I, I really believe that the Holy Spirit's orchestrating something for us today. It says, hey, if you'll stop <laughs> trying to bite at me as I reach my hand in to help you, I can actually bring some healing. So I want you to just put a hand on your heart. I'm going to pray for us. So Holy Spirit, right now, we just ask that you would do what you do best, that you'd reveal truth to our hearts, that you would bring forward, God, those things that we've kept back, those things that we've held back, the areas that we've said, let me figure this out, the areas where we've said, this hurts too much, I don't want you digging around in there. Would you bring those forward to us? And would you silence the voice of the accuser around them that we could actually bring it forward here? I'm just giving some space here for you to have time to deal with the Lord on that. I'm not in a hurry right now.
So at this time I'm going to invite, <clears throat> if you want prayer, if you need prayer around what was shared today, at this point I'm going to invite you to come forward. I'm not going to close the service right now specifically because I think that there's some more stuff that the Lord wants to do in the room. I really feel like there's people he wants to heal physically. But with that, if you need prayer, please come forward. Please come forward. And the, you can come forward at any time while we're praying and while we're going after some stuff here, but um, there's, there's this thing in scripture called a word of knowledge. It's basically just a moment where uh, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit starts to reveal some factual information to identify something that the Lord wants to go after, something that I would otherwise have no way of knowing in and of myself. Um, and it's a risk, and I'm willing to take that risk on the chance that God actually wants to heal some people and set some people free today. Amen? So I'm going to call a few things out. As I'm calling them out, lift your hand, and if you see somebody's hand go up next to you, just ask if you can put a hand on their shoulder, and then we're going to pray for them, okay? I was asking you if it's okay, but we're, that's what we're going to do. So... <laughs> um, there's somebody here, you've been having a recurring nightmare for like the last week or so. Um, and it's been waking you up in the middle of the night. You wake up with tightness in your chest. Who is that? Again, I'm taking a risk, so I could be wrong, but I'm feeling like there's, some, there's something there. Over here. Thank you, Lord. So again, just keep your hand lifted. We'll get some people to put their, put their hands on you to pray. Um, there's some, somebody else here. I think it could be a few people, but you, you've suffered with chronic migraines and something that starts at like the base of your skull and works its way around. Okay, so we've got one. Again, that's chronic chronic migraines that I think the Lord wants to heal. You've got stuff that starts from the back of your head, the base of your skull, and works its way around. If that's you, just lift your hand, because we want to pray for you. Oh, we got somebody else raising their hand here in the back. Just... Call out one more here, and then then we'll just start to pray. But um, the other one that I'm hearing, uh, the Lord wants to heal people who have an arrhythmia. You have an arrhythmia in your heart. I believe it's a generational thing. There's something going on. All right, there we go. Yeah, thank you, Lord. And last thing, if you, if you need healing in your body at all and you want the Lord to touch you and you want us to pray for you, can you just lift a hand so that we can pray for you as well? So again, we've got plenty of people in the back here. So just look around, find somebody with their hand lifted, ask them what they need prayer for and then we're just gonna pray. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you are the God who doesn't leave us in our pain. So Father, for those of us who came forward, those of us who needed prayer around what was shared and coming into the light, God, I bless them in their coming into the light. I thank you for what your word says, that when we confess our sins one to another, that. We, we get healing. So, Father, I thank you for healing and light to burst into the dark places of people's hearts. In Jesus' name, we claim the truth of Scripture that there's healing. We claim the truth of Scripture that when we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, God, where people need a cleansing in their hearts today, we thank you for the truth of your Scripture that says there's cleansing that happens in the confession. 
And Father, we pray for every single person who's receiving prayer now for healing in their bodies. Father, I thank you for releasing your presence and your fire on those people who actually came in with those chronic migraines. I thank you for your presence and your fire to burn that up, to set their skulls properly on top of their, on top of their spines and to release tension in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for healing in bodies. We thank you for setting arrhythmias straight. Father, we thank you for healing generational pains, generational diseases, and we declare healing and freedom. Healing and freedom. In Jesus' name. God, I bless your people, and we thank you for breakthrough. Breakthrough in bodies today. Breakthrough in bodies today. In Jesus' name.